I want to start off the lecture by talking about falling bodies as modeled by a differential equation. We're going to take a mass m. If we drop a mass m, there's two forces that are acting on it. First of all, there's a force due to gravity pulling the mass down. This is mass times the gravitational constant, the acceleration due to gravity. There's also a force working the opposite direction. That's the air resistance. And that's modeled by negative k times v, where k is the damping medium constant and v is velocity. So the two forces acting on the mass are Fa plus Fg, or negative kV plus mg. Well, we can also take into account Newton's second law of motion, which says the force is equal to mass times acceleration. And if we remember from calculus, acceleration is just the first derivative of velocity with respect to time. If we set these two forces equal to each other, then we get the following equation. If we want to put it in a more standard form where we've got all the dependent variables on the left hand side and the constants on the right hand side, then we'll get this equation. What this is is a first order, linear, ordinary differential equation. We could also look at the same equation instead of terms of velocity, we can look at it in terms of distance. Velocity is just the first derivative of distance with respect to time, and then we would get this equation. This would be a second order linear differential equation. But we're going to go and look at the model of a falling body in this form. Before we do that, however, I want to start talking about how we can find solutions without really knowing how to find solutions just yet. That is, we're going to come up with a way of finding qualitative solutions. That is, getting an idea of what the solution would look like, not necessarily getting an actual equation for the solution. We're not looking for analytical solutions here, just what the general solution would look like. Let's start with this example. x prime plus x equals 12. Let's go ahead and solve this for x prime. If we remember, the first derivative is just the slope of the tangent line. We can start getting an idea of what happens to the solution. If the slope is positive, that is if x prime is positive, we have an increasing function. If x prime is negative, then our function or our solution will be decreasing. Here's another differential equation. dy dx is equal to 0.2xy. Again, if the slope or dy dx is increasing, it's going to be positive. And if dy dx is negative, it's going to be a decreasing solution. So let's say I pick the point 2 comma 3. Well, if I plug 2 comma 3 into dy dx, I get a positive answer. So I know at the point 2 comma 3, what's going to happen to the function is it's going to have a slope of about positive 1. So if I fill this entire xy region with little slopes, this would be called a direction field or a slope field. Each little line is called a lineal element. Well, let's get an idea of how to find these. To help demonstrate direction fields, I'm going to go to one of my favorite websites. It's Paul's Online Math Notes, and it's at tutorial.math.lamar.edu. He has excellent notes for algebra, calc 1, calc 2, calc 3, and differential equations. It's a great resource to use. And we're going to go back to that falling body equation that we came up with before. We're going to assume that we have a mass of 2 kilograms and that k is going to be 0.392. When we do that, we get the following differential equation. Notice he has it in a different form. He has the v on the right-hand side of the equation. But it's the same form that we had before. What we want to do is start at an easy point. So to do that, we're going to take this equation and find what velocity will give us a slope of 0. Solving for v, we get an answer of 50 meters per second. So that means any time the velocity is v, the slope should be equal to 0. So you can see this on the beginning of the direction field that Paul's notes is showing. Right at 50, every little lineal element has a slope of 0. So let's look at some other points. Instead of looking at 50, what happens if we pick a velocity of 40? At 40, the slope will be about positive 2. If we go even slower, let's say 30 meters per second, we get a slope of almost positive 4. If we go back to Paul's notes, 
we'll see that as we get slower in terms of velocity, the slope of the lineal element increases. All along a particular velocity, the slope is going to be exactly the same. It's not shocking to see that if we went above 50, we would start then getting negative slopes. Let's check that for 1. Here we get a slope of about negative 2. And you can see above the line v equals 50, the slopes are all decreasing. And this is called a direction field. This lets us know what the solution looks like without really solving it. If we picked a particular initial value, for instance in this case we started at a velocity of 30, all you do is follow the arrows to see where the actual solution goes. And in this case it increases as it starts approaching 50. Depending on our initial conditions, we're going to have a different solution. This is like the family of solutions we talked about before. Depending on your initial condition, you will have a different solution path through this direction field. Next we're going to build a direction field using MATLAB. You could either use MATLAB and download the file dfield8.m, or you can go to the link on the Blackboard website, which is a web-based Java program that you can use instead of using MATLAB. To use dfield, you need to set up the different differential equation. What we want to use is v prime equals 9.8 minus 0.196 v. But you'll soon learn as we use MATLAB that I can't just say 0.196 v, I have to put the multiplication symbol in there. When I proceed, I get something that's not very interesting looking until I realize that we have to change our display window. We don't want to look at negative time, so we'll start at t equals 0. And let's go up to t equal 5, like we have. The minimum velocity that we want would be 0, and the maximum velocity will be about 100. And when we proceed now, we see something quite similar to what we saw in Paul's online notes. And if you click anywhere on the screen, you'll get the solution along that initial value. So if I start at around 50, I stay at 50. If I start at 40, I have a positive slope until I approach 50. Selecting different values of initial velocity below 50 all show increasing slope in approaching 50. If I select points above 50, then we see we have a negative slope and it approaches 50 from above. You'll have some homework assignments that you'll need to use D field. You can just go ahead and use that print button and print your direction fields directly from D field 8. Again, those little lines are called lineal segments, and if we look along one particular value, for instance, at the velocity 10, all along 10, no matter what the time is, we have the same positive slope. You'll have just one or two homework assignments where, where you'll be asked to draw a direction field without using D field 8. So let's look at how we do this. What we want to do is find what are called isoclines. That is, lines with the same slope. In our last example, isoclines were all in the form v equals a constant. For instance, along the line v equals 50, all the lineal elements had the same slope. Along the line v equals 10, all the lineal elements still had the same slope. We're not going to have that in this case, however. Let's start off again at looking at when we'd have a slope of 0. When we'd have a slope of 0, if I solve for the equation of a line in slope intercept form, I get the form y equals negative x. That means we start at 0 and move by the slope of negative 1. At all these points, I have a slope of 0. I'm getting a little sloppy here. Really, I should have arrows on all these lineal elements. But my graph will look awfully messy if I continue to do that. So I'm just going to be drawing lines, but they should have little arrows on them. This line is called an isocline because all the lineal elements on it have the same slope. Let's look at another slope. If I have a slope instead of positive 1, again I'm going to put this in slope intercept form, I have the same slope of negative 1, but now my y-intercept is 1. So along all those points, I have a slope of positive 1. If I went up another line, I would have a slope of positive 2. If I went below, if I instead had a slope of negative 1, that would be the line y equals negative x minus 1, and so on. Well, let's go and check our work with MATLAB. So I've gone ahead and set up my D field setup, but this time I have my dependent variable y, and I've changed my independent variable to x, and I'm looking at a window of negative 5 to positive 5. And when I do this, I do see along the line 
y equals negative x, a slope of 0. And when I look at the line y equals negative x plus 1, I have a slope of positive 1. Again, I can choose initial values and see what my solution curves will look like. These are all valid solution curves. The curve that is the correct answer depends on what your initial value is. If I told you an initial value was y of 0 is equal to 1, I would simply click on the point 0 comma 1, and that would be my solution curve. Again, these are qualitative types of solutions. I don't know what the equation of this line is, but it does tell me what my general solution will look like. Let's go ahead and look again at the M&M &M model that we came up with. Y prime is equal to negative 0.5 Y plus 10. And I've changed my display window to match what we graphed. And when I look at this, I see that if we start at 50, we see the solution that we came up with. The value settled out to 20. And this is another thing these qualitative solutions will be telling us. As X or T go to infinity, what do our solutions look like? Again, if I had started below 20, it would have still approached 20. And if I had started with a much larger number than 50, I still would eventually get to an equilibrium point of 20. We've talked about different ways of classifying differential equations. We talked about ordinary differential equations versus partial. So that was ODE versus PDE. We talked about the order of a differential equation. And we also talked about whether it was linear or nonlinear. There's another term that you need to no, and that's whether or not an ODE is autonomous. We won't be talking about PDEs in this context. An autonomous differential equation means that the independent variable does not explicitly appear in the equation. For instance, with our M&Ms, we had dy dt equals negative 0.5y plus 10. There was no t in the equation. Similarly, when we talked about the spread of disease, in this case, the dependent variable is x. The independent variable is t, and that does not appear in the equation. And the same thing with the mixture problem that we talked about. If you go back and look at the different models that we examined, none of them have t explicitly in the equation, which makes sense. Most models don't depend on t. They depend on change in time, but not what the actual time is. For instance, when I did the M&M &M experiment in my daytime class, we got the same results that we did in the evening class. That is, the time I did the experiment didn't affect the result. So that's why for models, we generally are talking about autonomous differential equations. Drawing direction fields can be, well, let's just say a little bit tedious. So let's look at another way we can get a general idea of what's happening with our solutions. Let's look at a differential equation in this form, dp dt equals p times a minus b p. And we'll notice that this is, in fact, an autonomous differential equation. It's also a first order differential equation. So we're going to be able to use a method using a phase portrait to give us a general idea of what the solution looks like. To do this method, we're going to first have to find our critical points. This book calls these points critical points, but there's other terminology. They're also called equilibrium points or stationary points. My favorite word would be equilibrium point, and I'll show you why. If I told you that the equilibrium point, or the critical point, or the stationary point for the M&M &M situation was 20, I think it becomes clear that in this case, an equilibrium point is a place where everything sort of settles to. So I think the word equilibrium point more clearly explains what we're talking about. But this textbook uses the term critical point, so we'll stick with that. The critical points are when the first derivative equals 0. So to find when those equal 0, we're just going to find the zeros of the differential equation. This is already in factored form. So we have two equilibrium points. We have when p is equal to 0, or when a minus bp is equal to 0, or in this case where p is equal to a over b. And I'm going to say that both a and b are greater than 0. Once we have our critical points, we're going to draw a one-dimensional phase portrait, or phase portrait for short. You can either draw this horizontally or vertically. I tend to draw them as such. And what we're going to do is put our two critical points on that line. So now we've broken the line up into three separate sections. 
We have a section here where we're above the point A over B. We have a point in here where we are between the point zero and A over B. And we have this section where we are below the point zero. Whatever direction the slope is going in each one of these intervals, it'll stay that direction. So if we had a positive slope between zero and A over B, no matter where we were in that interval, it would always be a positive or increasing slope. So what we're going to do is do a test point in each of these regions to find out if the slope is increasing or decreasing. So let's go ahead and do that. Now I don't know what A and B are. A could be greater than B or B could be greater than A, but I know if they're both positive, they're both above the number zero. And I'm just going to arbitrarily say A is going to be equal to 10 and B is equal to two. Now I could have picked anything, but as long as I've picked those points, I can then pick a, an appropriate test point to make sure I'm in my three different regions. So if I want to pick a point in the green region, I want to pick a point such that P is less than zero. Well, let's let P equal negative one. We want to see what the sign of dP dt is. Again, dP dt was P times A minus BP, and I'm going to use my A and B values, and when I do this, I find that I get a negative number. I don't really care what that number is, I just know that it's negative. So I'm going to go up in this green region and show an arrow going down for a decreasing slope. Now I'm going to pick a test point between the point 0 and 5. Let's let P equal 1. When I plug in that value for P in my A and B, I find that this is equal to a positive value. So this means I have an increasing slope in that region. And finally, let's let P equal 10. That's clearly above 5. So dP dt would be 10 times 10 minus 2 times 10, and I see this would be a negative answer. So I would have a decreasing slope. So now what do I do with this? Well, I can take this and then draw an approximate solution curve to this problem. Here is P versus T. I've got one critical value at zero, and I have another critical value at A over B. In the area between zero and A over B, I had an increasing slope. So I know I'm going to have something in this direction. However, I have to make sure I don't cross my critical points. So the only way I'm going to be able to draw that is a solution curve that looks something like that. Below the critical point zero, it's a decreasing slope. It's got to go in this direction. The only way I'm going to be able to draw that, again without it crossing my critical point, is for it to be looking like this and above A over B I'm going to have again a decreasing slope so the only way I'm going to be able to do that without crossing my critical points is to have something that looks like this. So this gives us without doing any solving it gives us an idea of what the general solution looks like for our differential equation dP dt equals P times A minus B P. We notice that the equilibrium point or critical point A over B seems to be drawing the solution towards it, while the critical point zero, the solutions seem to be going away from that. And these kinds of points have special names. If I have all solutions leaving a critical point, for instance at zero, both arrows go away, this is called a repeller. If, however, the arrows go towards the critical point, this is called an attractor. We can have a situation where the arrows are going in different directions. One is going towards the equilibrium point or critical point and one is going away from it. And this is called semi-stable. Let's see what happens when we look at another example, such as y prime equals sine of y. Again, to find the critical points, we're going to set the first derivative equal to zero. Well, sine of y is zero when y is equal to zero, or pi, or two pi, or negative pi, or negative two pi. In fact, there's an infinite number of critical points. What we'll do is just like we've done before, and that's put these critical points on our phase portrait. When we do that, and if we look at the test points in between our critical points, for instance, sine of pi over two is equal to positive one, so that would be an increasing slope. 
at sine of 3 pi over 2 is a negative 1, so there would be a decreasing slope. And you see this pattern repeat infinitely in both directions. If I use D field to show this, we can see that what we came up with in terms of the critical point in the phase portrait is correct. If I pick a point between 0 and pi, I have a positive slope. If I go above pi but below 2 pi, I get a negative slope. And I see that for negative pi and negative 2 pi as well. We can see the critical point pi is in fact a attractor, and 0 and 2 pi and negative 2 pi are repellers.